Hey there, everyone. Today, I'd like to look at the terms ressentiment and bad conscience, two terms that figure prominently in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche and are useful ways in terms of understanding his critique of Christianity and specifically Christian morality. And Nietzsche is a hard thinker to understand, I think, primarily today because there's so many misconceptions about Nietzsche that Nietzsche is the father of fascism, that he's a nihilist, that he is upholding a kind of useless sense of destruction, which is not Nietzsche. Nietzsche's philosophy is oriented around the figure of the free spirit, which is embodied in Zarathustra and his Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And the free spirit is the person who is not only willing to look at the forms of morality that will debase humans and surpass those, but is willing to create their own moralities, who is going to be able to face up to the reality of struggles in life and learn how to cope with them and create. Hence Nietzsche's significance placed on art and literature and prose, you know. This is why Nietzsche is very much a life-affirming philosopher. He is not a nihilist. And in fact, nihilism is one of Nietzsche's greatest enemies, and he sees it being embodied in Christianity, which might be a little weird because you're like, well, Christianity is all about preaching love. Well, Nietzsche actually doesn't think that. Nietzsche, in looking at Christian morality, sees some of the hidden traps placed in Christian morality that define it as a preacher of death. And this is a common term that you get in Thus Spoke Zarathustra is he just lambasts, he being Zarathustra, lambasts the preachers of death. And, you know, obviously you can kind of think about these are like priests and things like that, but this can also just be Jesus in general and Moses or Abraham and other prophets. And in order to understand this critique that Nietzsche makes of Christian morality, I'm going to do this through maybe a little bit of an unorthodox method, which is John Milton's Paradise Lost. Now, I know this is not scripture, but Milton is actually very good at exemplifying the Christian response that Nietzsche is so opposed to when it comes to orienting oneself towards the world. Because, of course, Nietzsche doesn't believe in God, and he thinks that religion is partly created, in fact, mostly created for him, in order to debase life, in order to uphold certain people in positions of power and ensure that the majority of people maintain their position of servitude and submission and slavery through a moral system that upholds the debasement of humanity in general. Now, before we actually look at the self-debasing Christian morality, I think it's interesting to look at this one quote from Satan from book four, which actually really exemplifies the idea of the free spirit in Nietzsche's philosophy. And this is when Satan is trying to rationalize why Adam and Eve can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, knowledge forbidden? Suspicious, reasonless. Why should their Lord envy them that? Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? And do they only stand by ignorance? Is that their happy state? The proof of their obedience and their faith? O oh, fair foundation laid whereupon to build their ruin. Hence I will excite their minds with more desire to know and to reject envious commands invented with design to keep them low, whom knowledge might exalt equal with God's. So Satan is saying here, what's wrong with knowledge? Can it be sin to know? And if it is, then God has designed Adam and Eve to sin by making them ignorant in such a way where 
Satan is merely going to open them up to the desire to know in order that they might arise or be forever fallen. That's a quote from, I think, book one of Paradise Lost, and that's one of Satan's most famous quotes from the book. So we can see here the notion of the free spirit. It's someone who is not going to stand for the debasement of the human condition by defying or putting to the side the most important and most triumphant qualities of humans, namely knowledge. And Satan is saying, well, if they don't have knowledge of good and evil, then they've been put in this position for their own ruin, and they've been designed as such. I think of this like you're designing a park for the blind, but you put a bunch of sinkholes everywhere. And when a blind person stumbles into the sinkhole, you say, well, it was your fault. You didn't have the discernment between sinkhole and not sinkhole, evil and good, good and evil. It's like, how can they be lambasted for something which they had no ability to actually discern between? And Satan's saying, if they have no knowledge here, can it be sin to know? Now, raisonnement is a French term, as you can tell by the pronunciation, which Nietzsche uses to understand the person who is going to take all the responsibility that they have for their situation or the reality of their situation and put it onto someone else. They're going to enter a situation of resentment and they're going to say, no, it's your fault that I'm in this situation, which Adam and Eve do do at the beginning when they have been seduced by Satan in the serpent. They put all the blame on Satan and they say, oh, Satan is the one that tricked us. But then resentment turns into bad conscience. And this is the next phase of learning how to cope with their situation. And this leads directly to nihilism, because what it does is it says, no, I am the reason that I am in this bad situation. And if we look at Satan's justification and Satan's explanation of Adam and Eve's situation, of course, it's not their fault. You can't have fault if you don't have discernment. And thus, Adam and Eve are trying to reconcile with their situation by swallowing the ultimate pill of nihilism, which stands as the basis of the Christian conception of humanity and thus of morality. Because, of course, morality is, as Hobbes showed us, built on an understanding of the human condition, on our propensity towards suffering and evil and debasement of one another. And this turns inward to a debasement of oneself in order to be able to stand one situation in order to look around and say, okay, I can tolerate this because it's my fault, which of course it's not. And this is what Nietzsche is trying to do in his genealogy of morals. He's trying to understand the genealogy of morality, the way it develops, and the future of morality, of course, being the free spirit, being the übermensch, that person who can take the reins of morality, can tear down the old tablets of values, that being Christian morality, and then can build up a new system of morality or justice, which is going to help one actually be able to tarry with the world and create and affirm life. But let's look at what Milton says. In book 10, Adam is lamenting his situation, and he's trying to rationalize how is God going to make everyone else suffer for his suffering? Why is there going to be original sin, and why is he due to suffer from this? He says here, this is on line 766 of book 10 of this Penguin edition. God made thee of choice his own, and of his own to serve him. Thy reward was of his grace, thy punishment then justly is at his will. Be it so, for I submit his doom is fair, that dust I am, and shall to dust return. O welcome hour whenever, why delays his hand to execute with his decree fixed on his day? Why do I overlive? Why am I mocked with death and lengthened out to deathless pain? 
How gladly would I meet mortality, my sentence, and be earth insensible. How glad would lay me down as in my mother's lap. There I should rest and sleep secure. His dreadful voice no more would thunder in my ears. No fear of worse to me and to my offspring would torment me with cruel expectation. So what happens here is that Adam swallows this pill that I am the grime and dust of the earth and that I deserve to go back to dust. Of course, the parenthetical part here is for a crime that I didn't have the ability to discern about prior to the commitment of that crime. But of course, in order to tarry with the injustice of this situation, bad conscience results. And from this bad conscience, Adam debases himself to the lowliest of lowlies of God's creation. And as such, he longs for death. Why do I need to be here any longer if I've been forsaken to this lowly position? Death would be something that I would long for if this was my position in my mortal existence. Therefore, it's clear to see that raisonnement leads to bad conscience, which leads to the height of nihilism, which is the height of nihilism, the longing for death in order to grapple with one's existential condition. And the reason Nietzsche doesn't like this is, like I said before, it takes the most unique, most promising, most life-affirming qualities possible to humanity, namely the freedom of conscience, desire, the will to power, which, by the way, it does not mean the wanting of power, the acquisition of power as such. It is the power of the will. It is the power of creation in the will, of the affirmation of life within the will, which in a nihilistic perspective turns into the desire for power, turns into someone like the preachers of death, the priests who are going to use power in order to bring everyone else down in a sort of religious cult sort of situation. And what Nietzsche sees here is it takes things like the desire for knowledge, conscience, and it turns these into bad things. And Nietzsche doesn't see these as bad things. But in looking at his genealogy of morals, he looks at the way this has been treated in Christian morality and says, well, this has just been deemed a bad thing in order to keep people in a state of servitude or slavery. Adam continues and says, Thus what thou desirest and what thou fearest alike destroys all hope of refuge and concludes thee miserable beyond all past example and future. To Satan only like both crime and doom. O oh, conscience, into what abyss of fears and horrors hast thou driven me, out of which I find no way from deep to deeper plunged. So Adam is being plunged deeper and deeper into a state of struggle. And what happens? He debases his own conscience, his own ability of discernment, which has been given to him by Satan. And this is the Nietzschean reading of Milton's Paradise Lost, is that Satan was gifting the knowledge of good and evil, the ability to discern and to have a full aware conscience to humans. And this is what Nietzsche means by going under. When he says that my goings under shall be my goings over, this is what he means, that you have to go to the depths of your condition. You have to go under and you have to find the very roots of your condition and only from then can you understand them and be able to attack them at the roots in order to go over, in order to become the Ubermensch, the overman, not the Superman. Superman would be Zupermensch. So you have to go under 
before you can be this ubermensch, which is just, it's totally Nazified and turned into, oh, I'm just going to take advantage of other people. That's what the ubermensch means. That's not what the ubermensch means. The ubermensch is the free spirit who understands their existential condition and is able to create an affirm life by understanding their condition at its very core. And Christian morality for Nietzsche interferes with this ability because it takes away one's methods of freedom, the ways by which one might get rid of one's shackles, things like conscience and knowledge and discernment and desire and pleasure and power, and it debases those, turns them into sins, and keeps one in a position of permanent servitude. Now, the next stage of nihilism that happens after bad conscience is a state of pity. And this is the moment where one comes to desire to will one's own slavery, one's own servitude. It is the very core of that position of bad conscience, which is epitomized by pity, which is one of the things that Nietzsche detested the most, because Nietzsche thought that Christian morality is fundamentally concerned with pity. That it debases people to their detriment, of course, and it merely tries to appease life and to appease those in power in order that life might go quick. And hence Zarathustra's kind of funny retort where he, he says uh, to these sort of people, Oh, that they may go quicker or something to that effect. That, oh, may they just go by fast and I won't have to worry about them. Because these people are fundamental, fundamentally not concerned with the here and now. They're concerned with the next life. Oh, how can I debase this life in pursuit of the next? Which Nietzsche sees as fundamentally derogatory to everything affirmative about life here and now which is what our suffering is actually concerned with, and what creates these belief systems that try to tarry with that suffering. And at the very end of book 10, Adam arrives at a point where he begs for pity from God. He takes his situation and he accepts the position of toil and work that has been placed upon him by God which, of course, he doesn't deserve, but has been given to him nonetheless. And he says, with labor, I must earn my bread. What harm? Idleness had been worse. My labor will sustain me, and lest cold or heat should injure us, his timely care hath unbesought provided, and his hands clothed us unworthy, pitying while he judged. How much more, if we pray him, will his ear be open and his heart to pity incline, and teach us further by what means to shun the insellment seasons, rain, ice, hail, and snow. And he continues later on, And what may else be remedy or cure to evils which our own misdeeds have wrought? He will instruct us praying and of grace beseeching him, so as we need not fear to pass commodiously this life, sustained by him with many comforts, till we end in dust our final rest and native home. So the conclusion here is death. And what Adam here is concerned with is how can we make death come quickly and with relatively little suffering in this life? And what does one do? Beg for pity from one's master, dig deeper into a position of servitude and slavery, hence the master morality and the slave morality that Nietzsche is famous for, sink deeper into that position, and instead of releasing oneself from bondage, starting to love one's bondage. And this is the reason that Nietzsche does not like Christian morality. And the reason that resentment, bad conscience, and pity are some of Nietzsche's most hated ideas. But there is, of course, the future 
of the free spirit, which is always on one's shoulders, to face life as it is and learn how to tarry with it, not abstracting to the hereafter, but focusing on the here and now. So I hope this has helped understand Nietzsche's philosophy a little bit better, as well as maybe Paradise Lost. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on German idealism, postmodernism, gender theory, other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you need help reading some passages or talking about some philosophy problem. It's up to you. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one. Thank you.